Hey there, so there's a lot of bad arguing going on on the, the internet and in meat space nowadays. So I wanted to make this video to try and get people to think about how best to argue, how best to debate, how best to have discussions surrounding important issues. Now, when I speak about arguments, I mean an academic or a cognitive argument, where something cognitive is at stake. Is this proposition true? Does this idea have merit? How good is this interpretation of this data? Now, the philosopher Daniel Cohen hypothesized three different models for arguing. The first model is the dialectical model. It can be thought of it as arguing as a form of war with, you know, a lot of screaming, shouting, winning, losing. It may not be the most helpful model for arguing, but it is certainly very common. The second model is argument as proof. You can think of this as a mathematician's argument or a logician's argument. This is my argument. Does it work? Is it good? Is it based on a sound premise? Is it logical? The third model is really argument as performance. It's a rhetorical model where you tailor your argument to the audience at hand, like a politician trying to convince an audience of something. So of those three models, argument as war, the first one, really is the, the dominant one in our culture. And it brings several problems along with it. For one, it tends to be very polarizing, and the argument of one side may not be thought about or considered by the opposing side. But if the metaphor of argument is combat, then there's this implication that learning is losing. If I'm having a debate with someone and they construct a really, really coherent, well thought out, well defended argument, and if they have successfully responded to all my problems with their argument, then at the end of the debate, it is I, not them, who walks away with their point of view changed. I walk away being the smarter person at the end of the day. I have made a cognitive gain from their well-formed argument. What sort of cognitive gain did the other person make? Well, nothing really, save for some practice in articulating their position. So this model equates learning with losing, and therefore discourages learning. If you want to be on the right side of every argument, you have to be willing to change your position. So if we're going to make headway in restructuring how our society argues, we need to be open to learning, to entertaining the possibility that we might be wrong, to hearing our opponent's arguments, and if those arguments are good enough, be willing to accept defeat. So now that we've gone over the models for arguing, let's get to the core of arguing itself, the disagreements. Let's talk about the levels of disagreement and how to properly disagree. Essayist Paul Graham created a disagreement hierarchy, which I think works very well for our purposes. However, I'm going to be using a slightly modified version of Paul Graham's disagreement hierarchy. The lowest form of disagreement is name-calling. It is probably also the most common, tragically. Whether or not you're calling someone a shithead or a douche canoe, you're not responding to their argument at all. Also remember that more articulate name-calling carries just as little weight. Long words and Shakespearean insults don't improve this level of argument at all. The next level up in the disagreement hierarchy is the ad hominem attack. An ad hominem attack is an attack on a person's character. Again, you're still responding not to the argument or even to the writing, but to the writer. An ad hominem isn't as weak as name calling, it might actually carry some weight. For example, if someone were to say, well of course Mr. Stevenson supports nuclear power as the answer to our energy crisis. He owns stock in nuclear companies. Now that wouldn't really refute the author's argument, but it might point out a legitimate, possible conflict of interest. That's still a weak argument though, you should still be responding to the argument itself. Unless the possibility of a conflict of interest undermines his core argument, it shouldn't be the focus of your response. Similarly, saying that someone lacks the authority to construct an argument about a topic is a form of an ad hominem. Again, unless the person's background undermines your core argument, it should not be the crux of your counterargument. The next level is responding to tone. Here you are responding to the writing and not to the writer, so that's sort of an improvement, but you're still not addressing the actual argument itself. Saying something like, there's too much anger in your post, or how can you just say that in such a brazen fashion? While that's better than attacking the author, it's still sort of a weak form of disagreement. It matters much more whether or not the argument is correct than what the tone is, though we should endeavor to be polite to one another. But tone is especially hard to judge and often subjective. If you're going to be responding to the writing, the tone is probably the thing you should be least concerned with. If the author is incorrect somewhere in their writing, just say where. So in the next stage, we actually get around to responding to what was said. This is the contradiction stage, and that usually involves just stating the opposite case of whatever is being argued with no real evidence to support it. Stating a contradiction can have weight, as sometimes just seeing the opposite side will cause someone to consider it, but some evidence will usually help. At the next level, we have the counter-argument. Now, the counter-argument might actually prove something, 
Whereas most of the other forms of disagreement up to this point prove almost nothing. The counterargument is contradiction plus reasoning and or evidence. And when it's aimed squarely at the original argument, it can be convincing. However, the problem is that it is often not aimed solely at the original argument. It is frequently aimed at something slightly different. That is to say, the problem with just a counterargument, or the point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint, model, which so many debates seem to be locked into, is that it doesn't define which part of the argument it's responding to. This leads to the situation where two sides of an argument might actually agree with each other, but they don't know it since they're both arguing different angles. The next level up is refutation. Refutation is the most convincing form of disagreement, and it is rarely seen because it is so much work. To refute someone, you will need to respond directly to one of their arguments, which probably involves quoting them in some fashion or paraphrasing them, but you need to pull out an actual argument they have made to refute. You then use reason and evidence to pose your counterargument to that argument. Now if you can't find an actual quote of theirs to disagree with, you might be arguing against a straw man. And finally, the highest form of disagreement is refuting the central point. Up until now, it was still possible to pick out weaker aspects of the opponent's argument and refute those, and then claim that you've won the entire argument. Truly refuting someone's argument involves refuting their central point, and that means you must commit to what the central point is. You would have to say, the main point of the argument seems to be this, because the author has said this. However, this is wrong because, and then you follow up with your reason and evidence. So that's the disagreement hierarchy in a nutshell. So now that we've gone over both the models of disagreement and the disagreement hierarchy, let's take a look at some practical suggestions you can put to use in your daily life. One. Be polite. I know this is difficult when passions run high about a topic, but remember that it's about resolving a disagreement, not hurting the other party. Try to avoid bickering and insults. 2. Stay on topic. Remember what you're arguing about and avoid needless digressions. The social psychologist and game theorist Anatole Rappaport, who is best known for originating the tit-for-tat strategy in game theory, offered some points on how best to compose a critical commentary. 1. You should attempt to re-express your opponent's position so clearly and fairly that they say, thanks, I wish I'd thought of putting it that way. This is important because it ensures that both sides of the argument are on the same page. You make sure that your target knows you aren't deliberately mischaracterizing his arguments. And it prevents you from arguing against a straw man. What is the point of arguing against a straw man? You're not going to convince your target of your point of view since you haven't refuted their actual argument. All you've done is waste your time and energy. Making sure that you are debating the correct thing will save everyone a lot of time and energy. Two, you should list any points of agreement, especially if they're not widespread matters of agreement. Three, you should mention anything you have learned from your target. Four, only then are you permitted to say a word of rebuttal or criticism. Not only is this a more polite, civil way to disagree and debate, it ensures you don't waste your time by making sure everyone is on the same page, and it makes your opponent a much more receptive audience for your dissent or disagreement, which helps advance the discussion. So in the end, if we're going to reform how arguing is done in our society, we should keep the following things in mind. 1. Don't get caught up in viewing an argument as war. Remember that losing can have its own benefits. Be okay with learning. 2. Keep in mind the disagreement hierarchy. Always aim to refute your opponent's arguments if possible. 3. Practice civilized arguments. Re-express your opponent's position to make sure that you're arguing about the right thing. Remember to think about what you agree about, sometimes, not just what you disagree about. And be polite in your criticism. Be sure to try and back up your arguments with reputable sources and try and stay away from logical fallacies. If we can do that, we'll probably all be much better off. Thanks for watching.